Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao. Konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum. Shalom, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're part of our beautiful Reading with Your Kids family. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Mickey Boaz. She is here to celebrate one in five, how we're fighting for our dyslexic kids in a system that is failing them. Before we invite Mickey in to start this incredibly important conversation about education, I want to tell you about a really fun way for you, for, for your kids to learn. It's called Cats, Roblox, Challenges, and Friends. Let's go camping. This is a virtual camp uh, that is offered by our friend Cat Blount. Cat Blount is a wonderful children's author. She has been featured here on the podcast in the past. And she wants to invite your kids to visit Camp Catawaka, where you will have fun and thrive with fellow campers in this week-long Roblox experience. Now, what Kat has done is she's uh, use, using the Roblox uh, gaming platform to develop really cool learning experiences for small groups of kids. It's secure. It's only those kids that have signed up with their parents and the kids are age 10 to 12 that will have access. Cat is online playing with the kids. The kids have lots of fun and they'll also learn a number of really important life skills like communication, team building, listening and attention, management, budgeting, problem solving, critical thinking, following directions, uh, memory recall, socialization. Uh, it, it, socialization is so important right now, especially when kids aren't able to spend time with their friends. Check it out today. Go to outschool.com slash teachers slash cat dash blount. B-L-O-U-N-T. So that's outschool.com slash teachers slash cat dash blount. And find out about Camp Catawaka and all the fun your kids can have. Johnny is on the line right now from the Northern Jersey area. She is the author of a really important book. It's called One in Five, How We're Fighting for Our Dyslexic Kids in a System That is Failing Them. Please welcome to the show, Mickey Boys. Mickey, how are you? Good, good. How are you, John? I'm wonderful. I'm really happy to, to have you on, and I'm excited to speak about this book, One in Five, and, and speak about... I, I'm 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 really bummed out that we have to speak about the fact that we're failing our kids with special needs. Why don't you begin by just telling us, giving us the um, the overview of one in five? Yeah, thanks so much for having us and and talking about this important topic, especially on our book launch day today. We launched the book one and five into this world. So very excited to talk with you today. So yeah, I'll start out with my story and how I got to mm-hmm. write in this book. Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I live in Jersey city. I have two boys that um, have dyslexia. I saw them struggling in schools. I didn't know what was going on. Um, and we, it was clear in first grade that my son was struggling. He was not keeping up with his peers. And as you know, proficient readers at, at age seven is when you are hitting that milestone. And he was nowhere near it. And um, he was in a charter school and we were able to get him diagnosed with dyslexia. And for of those of your readers who don't know what dyslexia is, it's basically they have a, a difficulty with reading and they are not a, but they are highly intelligent. And so it is about reaching their full potential. And that's where the uh, crux of our story starts to fall down. Um, I thought that getting a diagnosis of dyslexia and attention issues would open up a world of possibilities, but I was wrong. Um, He was only given 30 minutes of reading support that he needed a week to read in the critical years of reading, um, as you know, with your mission. And um, I asked for more support. Can I get more time? No. Is there more money for the teachers? No. Um, Can I 
like substitute teach so the teacher can get more training. No, 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 no. And as a parent who wants the best for your child, that wasn't an acceptable answer. And so it took me four years, four lawyers and four different school formats to finally get him the help he needed. And no parent should have to go through that. And so that's why I wrote this book, because there's a national education crisis for 20% of the U.S students in the U.S. And um, I wanted to get to the root cause of why this was happening. And so as I started to talk to people about it, when I had come out of the battle, I had no idea the numbers were so big. I had no idea. And it's a very lonely and isolating battle. So, you know, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to more people about it. And um, as I started talking to people, I realized um, I talked to Simon and Schuster and I said, hey, Let's get together and go figure out this, the, the reason. And so I went across the country, actually talked to people in Boston, North Carolina, Seattle, everywhere around the country. And I realized that we were all facing the same three issues. It comes down to uh, the lack of funding, the lack of early intervention, and the lack of teacher training. And as you know, there's such a small window to catch this and to, to give it the support that it needs. And because dyslexia is an invisible disability, it, the support really falls on the parents to speak up and to identify um, the, this gap and this concern to your teachers. And I believe the teachers want to help and, and want to provide the resources, but because of our lack of funding, we they don't have the money to support them. And so if you're not reading proficiently, as you know, by third grade, the dropout rates are four times higher. And children with dyslexia are twice as likely to drop out of high school than, than people in the general population. So my hope with this book is that um, I can provide a sense of community, a sense of urgency, and by telling there's 19 other stories featured in this book besides mine, that we can um, figure out ways to, to, to use innovation and ingenuity to get our kids to read. There, there's so much, so much that, that, <laughs> that you put, and, and it is, it's a huge issue. And I, I think one thing that we don't consider is, you know, here you are, you're an intelligent woman, you have some resources, uh, you have some support, you were able, to, and it was a struggle for you, you had to fight for years, you had to get lawyers, you had to go in and articulate and, and advocate for your kids, and you're actually one of, the, your kid is one of the lucky ones, because of all those kids who are struggling with dyslexia and, and other uh, learning challenges, a huge percentage of those kids don't have somebody like you who has the resources and the ability to stand up and speak for them and advocate for them. And, 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 and that's, that's just, that's a, a sin. I'm sorry. I mean, I can't. No, it is. I mean, you're right. Jen. It's two thirds of children with learning disabilities go undiagnosed. So let's think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, to your point, my kids are lucky that, my mom was a speech therapist and she was able to see these signs. My husband saw the sign. My husband's dyslexic and he saw the same struggles that, that we saw, but you're right. We're lucky. And a lot of it comes down to parental support, right? There was a survey of made by dyslexia that said those who were able to find success had a parent really kind of like driving, driving that way. 35% of entrepreneurs have dyslexia and uh, the juvenile prison population, 85% cannot read. And so to your point, it's a sin. It's tragic that we're allowing this to happen because the education system was not built to support the brains of children with dyslexia. And th those numbers are too large to ignore. Absolutely. Talk. I, I want to talk about the solutions, but talk a little bit about the consequences of not addressing this and and you know we we want we want people to invest in education but what if we don't invest in, we we know what happens talk a little bit about what happens when we don't invest in education yeah when we don't invest in education um you, you'll see a lot of the stories in the book. Well, one of them that breaks my heart the most is a story out of Washington, but your child feels like they're not worth it. The social and emotional effects of, of to, to your question of not giving the support, I think is the most tragic part of this because um, when you make a child feel like they're stupid or not worth it, 
or don't have value in society, they're forced to find other places to seek value and validation. And so uh, people go to the streets, people seek attention in other ways. And that, and, and one of the women's uh, children in our book, like committed, tried to commit suicide and she was able to save her. But that is, those are the consequences of what happened. The social and emotional challenges. And if we spent one ounce of money, I'm sure this can apply to many of your authors and many of the causes that you talk about. But if we spent one ounce of money on prevention, we could uh, salt, we could save it in all the remediation and mental health services that we give on the other side. I mean, um, the cost to for a lawsuit is the same cost that you could spend on training six teachers. So that I think that is the way that you prevent those tragic outcomes. Yeah. One of the things that we've talked about here, I'll just throw this because you've really done a deep dive into this. Uh, you know, my wife's been a uh, special needs teacher for over 33 years, and part of her job is to sit down with each kid and devise, uh, and, 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 and with the additional therapists and other educators, and devise an individual education plan for these kids. Of, of course, a lot of cases that the education plan is developed and then there's no money to fund it or whatever. But I'm, uh, I'm of the opinion that every kid, needs an individual education plan because even if you know not every kid has dyslexia but there's a ton of kids who have dyslexia and not every kid has ADHD but a ton of kids have them and the kids who aren't presenting with an obvious learning challenge they have special needs and and the best way to address those is individually instead of throwing everybody in the same class and thinking let's let's learn yeah, I mean, I completely agree. So under um, the laws of the that regulate special education, there's 13 different types of disabilities. So in your wife's class, she's being asked to serve 13 different types of needs. Dyslexia is one of the largest needs that's being asked to be served. And so if that's the case, I agree. I think to your point, the way that is effective for my child to learn is to have a trained teacher and reading interventionist, liter structured literacy specialist, giving instruction in a consistent way multiple times during the week. And so I, that is physically impossible for your wife to do and other special education teachers. And I sympathize and empathize with them. And, um, I mean, my younger son is in a charter school of 600 uh, children, and there's two literacy specialists on staff. There's just not enough to go around. And so that puts the burden on us as parents, and imagine what we're all dealing with in this pandemic, right, to to have to be able to, to help our children. And I just think it's a civil rights injustice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, we all have the, the, the right to education, one of one of our guests. It was a very powerful moment. Uh, Lavar Burton, the, the host of Reading Rainbow, was on mm -hmm. the show, and I asked him why he was so passionate about reading, and he said, "and and I'm I'm, I'm not quoting verbatim because he was much more eloquent and articulate than I could ever be, but he just said that 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 reading and literacy, being literate, is emancipating, and it frees you, and it gives you the ability to go out and to." discover information on your own and you're not at the whim of others you don't have to depend on others to form your opinions yeah i mean and that's the technique that i use actually to get my kids to read so it's something that they struggle with and i'm try to talk to them about uh fight through this, use your skills so that you can learn about adventure. My youngest son loves adventure books. My older son loves reading the Who is Albert Einstein books. He loves history. And so if if they can have those skills to take in what they want, I feel like the world is their oyster. And so that's how I try to kind of work in reading and 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 things that they struggle with to, to move forward. Now, I'm, I'm imagining, I always try to play devil's advocate or just put myself in, in somebody else's, you know, in, into a listener's brain. And, and I'm mm -hmm. thinking there might be somebody out there listening, saying, ah, oh, there's another mom is complaining, her kids are not being treated right, and blah, blah, blah. And, and she has the answers to, to all this. It's much more complicated. Education is this big system, and it's really uh, complex. And, and a mom in Jersey City just can't, you know, know the answers. But you're not just a mom in Jersey City. You work with 
giant corporation is helping them fix their broken systems. <laughs> That's an interesting point. Yeah. So, so um, yes, um, the, not just a mom in Jersey City. I help big corporations to fix broken systems. Yeah. Um, I was raised by parents that taught me that change is essential and you can make change wherever you need to. And I've taken that into my professional life for big brands. And I think it helped me to think as a strategist, which is what I do for a living, a strategist and a storyteller. I think it helped me frame how do I set up this national education crisis in a way that creates change? Because opportunities that you're giving me to tell all of our stories together makes the Board of Education thinks differently, makes your senators think differently. It makes the more that we tell the emotional stories, that's how you create change. And that's what I wanted this book to be. So I use my professional background in, in making strategies to move big, um, you know, mission-driven companies to the biggest mission of my life, which was telling these stories. I had to be vulnerable in a way that I've never been before. I had to think about how to expose this to different people in a way I've never thought about it before. And it's such a personal, gratifying day to be, like, sharing this with you on our launch day. So, yeah. Yeah. Tell me, is there um... – you, you, you traveled around the country. Is the problem the same in every part of the country? Yes, the problem is the same everywhere. And that's the hypothesis that I worked on with Simon & Schuster. I said, I don't think a book about me and my story is interesting. I think that this is interesting when we can show that your wife is saying the same things in Boston. There's a crazy story. There's a different story going on in Seattle, right? But in Houston, for example, in Texas, the um, Board of Education capped the number of special education students that could be served. And if you were serving more students than they asked you to, you would get dinged for serving more students. I mean, these are national problems. I heard a crazy story in, in Arizona about the same thing. So to answer your question, it is, um, it is a na nationwide problem. And I think through structuring this book to showcase that, anyone and everyone can get around this and, and try to make our voices heard. Yeah. Now, you're talking about telling emotional, personal stories. What and you, and you shared a lot about your story with, with your son. What, who else are we going to meet in one in five? Yeah. Um, so I, I like this story a lot. There's a woman and I met in North Carolina who moved from England and she was a cop for a living, right? A professional like fact finder. And the stories that you hear of what she had to go through, they they fought for two years almost to not give the diagnosis that she needed for her child. And why did they do that? Because if you actually test and, and accept that one in five have dyslexia, that means you have to have the funds to serve it. So for two years, they spent denying her the testing to even say that he was dyslexic. And then you know, she had to go through a crazy story to get to the end, but now he's in a in a language-based school for learning differences and is thriving. And, you know, he looks up to his father, who was an entrepreneur. That's how my dad's brains works. And like, you know, she she fought for years and it, it was it was a, a really horrible story. Um, there's, um, you know, uh, there's a woman in a bilingual school in Chicago, and she was told that her child did not deserve the right to an education because she was struggling because English was not her first language. And so it's okay. She'll catch up because she's, she's speaking two languages, and that's actually not the case. Dyslexia is a neurobiological condition that applies to all different types of languages. Um, uh, yeah, so those are some of the stories that you'll see in one of five. Wow, it must have been an exhausting experience for you to 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 see this happening over and over again with with all these other kids. What was it that kept you going? That 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 kept you focused to complete this mission? Yeah, I mean, I feel lucky. I feel so lucky that I have the support of my mom and my husband and my family to get my sons out of this situation. And I kind of believe it's my, my duty as I was summoned to this community one way or another to make sure that I can 
set things up to be better for other kids. And it was like therapy as after I would get out of these interviews, I was like, Oh my goodness. Like I, I got to use my strategy and innovation way to figure out a way to solve that problem. Like I'm a problem solver at, at heart. And so that's what kept me going through this. Like, how do we solve this? How do we get to the end of this? How do my grandkids not run up against the same situations that my kids are facing? And so that's really what kept me yeah. going. What kind of – somebody who's listening to this who, who might be a grandparent, um, you know, they don't have kids, their kids are grown, how can they support families like yours? Yeah, um, grandparents is actually a really good point. Um, I, I feature a grandparent, only grandparent in the, in the book, um, and she uh, realized that her daughter had so many uh, – obligations than things that she was doing and so she just took the granddaughter by the hand and started showing up at the parent teacher conferences she was actually a special education teacher in a previous life so she knew what to do and how to work with the teachers and how to accommodate it and so i think as we're in this world of parent as teachers and sometimes that dynamic doesn't work really well with the younger children i think that grandparents can play a role as levity as you know reading a book together as maybe another voice to the teachers of what they're seeing right so how can they um chime into the conversation to help yeah. I, you know we we're all about inspiring families to read with their kids throughout their lives uh, but especially the young kids are there signs that you noticed or that you've come to learn that a, a parent might start noticing when they're reading to the kids when the kids are three or four years old that can let the parents know hey i gotta be on this i have to start advocating for my kid now i don't need to wait until they're in first or second grade and already behind the eight ball mm -hmm. yeah there's some clear like early identification signs so um not being able to understand the sounds behind the alphabets um you know dyslexia is commonly thought of as misplacing and reversing letters but it's so much more than that but if you do see signs that, that's something um uh memorization like they can't remember the things that they just learned they can't sort the order they can't tell back to you what they just read these are all start to be signs and and, and to your point judge you can accurately diagnose dyslexia at five wow. and um only 6% of children with dyslexia are diagnosed at 6 and 40% are diagnosed at 10. So let's think about proficient readers at age 7. That's a huge gap that mm -hmm. we're looking at. So your point about parents noticing it is very important. My child, when he struggles, um, even now reading, he um, uses attention, his his. Um, his acting skills to get around reading the word and he'll adjust his his clothes he'll stand up and try to act out something and you have to really redirect them and focus them to get back to the word because when things are hard you, you don't want to push through them and so I think those are some clear signs that parents can use to speak to their teachers yeah uh, before you go one of the things I love to do since I present educational magic shows around the country uh, oftentimes I'll ask an educator uh, or somebody like yourself, if I handed you a magic wand and you were able to use that to, to fix the system and to make sure that every kid got the support they need, what would you do with that wand? I would have the children magically walk through one of your uh, magic booths and have them scanned and understood by the age of five that there's something going on. Um, I would then hire a hundred more of your wives and make sure that um, not only four out of 10 teacher training schools taught the science of reading, but I would have everyone who becomes a teacher trained in how to teach my children. And most importantly, I would make sure that the federal government and the local governments get the money that they need and deserve to support the one in five kids who have dyslexia. Absolutely. Uh, Mickey, this is real important. I, you know, we definitely want to encourage everybody to check out one in five, how we're fighting for our dyslexic kids in a system that is failing them. Uh, how else can folks connect with you, find out more about the book and find out more about this issue? Yeah. Um, so I started a, a site called Invisible Red Tape, um, which talks about 
the the barriers that we have to cut through in order to to help our children and provide solutions and ideas there. So you can sign up, you can follow along, you can email me any way that I can help your readers. I'm totally happy to. We've had a, a really enlightening chance to, to 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 talk with our guest today, Mickey Boaz. Her book is One in Five: How We're Fighting for Our Dyslexic Kids in a System That Is Failing Them. Mickey, thanks so much for being part of the show today. Thanks so much for having me, John. I really appreciate it. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We are going to meet an incredible mother-daughter team. Amanda Lynch is coming back on the show with her amazing daughter, Ava Holloway, to talk about my ancestors' wildest dreams and the event that inspired it. This is this is a really wonderful interview. I had such a great time. Amanda's a great guest at an amazing time meeting her daughter. She is really an impressive young woman. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. If you are the author of a great children's book, we would love to have you as a guest. Being a guest is fun. It's easy. It gives you the chance to tell thousands of people about your fantastic book. All you need to do is to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the contact button at the bottom of the page. Let us know about your great book. We'll let you know the next easy steps. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so very wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our guest, Nikki Boaz. Be sure to check out One in Five. I also want to thank my incredible team, starting with my producer, Fatima Khan. I want to thank my amazing author, Ambassador Peggy Cotto. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. <laughs>